Now it is recording. So really excited to, um, to introduce you all to Dessa Cosma. Uh, Dessa has come and spoken at other LDO trainings in the past and um, she is the executive director now of Detroit Disability Power. Um, and before that, she worked at the uh, Center for Progressive Leadership. Um, she's also a regular speaker and leader of retreats um, with Allies for Change. Um, and she is well respected and renowned and requested um, throughout the disability and um, social justice community. And she's going to be talking with us about mining our lives, our stories um, for the advocacy work that we do. Thanks, Dessa, for joining us. Really glad to be here. Thanks, Amy, for that really nice introduction. It's nice to see you all. I know I've met some of you before. Um, and I'm glad to be back with LDO. Uh, also, full disclosure, I am still getting used to doing workshops on Zoom. And there are likely to be hiccups and or weird things. Um, so I ask you all for a little grace and patience uh, if, the, if that occurs. And also, um, you know, this is a nice small group, so we can be really casual. And so I want to share some information and do some skill building with you all. Um, but I also really want to hear from you. And I would I have my glass. rather you all, you know, uh, interrupt with questions and ideas than uh, hold them all back and then forget them right later in, in the in the hour and a half we have together so chime in um, you can do that verbally you could do that by just raising your hand you could do that through the chat um, whatever's best for you but um, let's make this interactive um, so that we get the most out of it so um, as Amy said, I'm Dessa. I live in Detroit and I run an organization called Detroit Disability Power, which organizes uh, people with disabilities and our allies around all sorts of different issues. Um, we work on accessible housing issues, accessible voting, um, pretty much you name something happening in Southeast Michigan, um, we're probably involved in it in some way. Um, because as all of you know, there's not a single thing um, that doesn't affect disability community and people with disabilities. There's not a single policy that doesn't have implications for us. Um, there aren't decisions made at the city, state, or federal levels that don't impact us. Everything impacts us. And oftentimes, as we know, um, our perspective, our needs, our experiences are not necessarily considered in those decisions. Um, and many of the people making those decisions uh, are not people with disabilities. They don't necessarily know what our lives are like. And so, you know, here we are to be good advocates and organizers to really push those folks uh, to make decisions that are good for us because we deserve that. Um, and because we have so much expertise and wisdom to offer the people in those decision-making uh, positions. And so our, our task really, is to figure out how to communicate that well to them in a compelling way uh, so that they understand and are moved to act in ways that are good for us as a community. So um, that's, the, that's where I'm coming from with all of this. Um, I think we should be the people in charge. So, you know, this advocacy to move people to um, make decisions that are good for us is part of the work. But I think the other part of it is really getting ourselves into those positions of leadership because nobody knows what our life is like like we do. Um, and so uh, keep that in mind too. Um, I wanna do a quick round of introductions if you all are willing, um, just so that I get to know you a little bit better. Um, and so what I would like is if we can um, each say our name, what part of Michigan we're from, and one thing that you find interesting about yourself. Um, so one thing you find interesting about yourself, it can be silly or it can be serious, totally up to you. Um, and then I would ask that when you've shared your name, what part of Michigan you live in and something you find interesting about yourself, you then pass it to someone else who hasn't gone yet. Um, and if you get called on and you're not ready to go, it's okay to pass and we'll, we'll come back to you. Does that, Sound good to everyone? Sure. Great. Um, all right, would anybody like to start? 
I'm Barbaria. I'm from East Lansing. I'm with the same board, and I also work with UCP Michigan. Um, I I don't know what I find in your sheep but myself. Um, I don't know. You don't know. Um, okay. Well, if you think of something, we'll come. We'll come back. We want to hear it. I'm, okay. I'm. I'm sure there's so many interesting things that you're having trouble choosing. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> keep us posted, Barbara. Who do you want to pass it to? Um, I don't know who. Cancer. I don't know. I can't see everybody. You, you asked if Catherine would be willing to go next? Yeah. Catherine, are you willing to go next? Um, yeah, I didn't. Sorry, I, I didn't hear. I think my volume cut out. Um, I'm Catherine Hyde. I'm from Brighton. And uh, something interesting about me is that I am a huge Survivor fan. You got a lot of company in that. <clears throat> Who do you want to pass it to, Catherine? Uh, Dominic. Hello, I'm Dominic uh, from Epsilon, Michigan. Um, one thing I find interesting about myself, there's a lot of things, I guess, but. Um, I'm really open-minded, like, so I'll, I'll take that. Great. Oh, oh I, for, it to? <laughs> I forgot. I was, I was like, been talking and muted myself, and I was like, oh, okay. Uh, Megan, mm -hmm. ready? Hi, my name. Yeah, I hear you. Hear me? Yep. Okay. My name is Megan Johns. I'm raised from Pennsylvania, but I'm living in Waterford. That was something interesting me. I can't think of one. What's this about me? All right. We we if you if you when you do, we'll come back to you because we want to hear it. Um. Who do you want to pass it to, Megan? Who's left? Uh, Renee. Renee. Let me unmute you, Renee. Okay, I think I go up. Yep. Renee Cottle. Mm -hmm. Renee Cottle, I go Vesselberg, um country, go um, north, go Detroit, north, or Michigan, or Mint, 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 whatever. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I like go, um, cooking and, um, garden. One. I'm with you. Thank you, Megan. And Renee, yeah. I mean, sorry, Renee. <laughs> I'm learning. Renee. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> yeah. Uh, Frank, how, how about you? You want to go? Sure. Hi, I'm Frank Vaca. I'm from Pondville, Michigan, and I found myself a go getter. Excellent. And how about Amy? I'm Amy Stirk. I'm from the west side. I'm from just uh, west of Grand Rapids, a town called Jenison. And uh, oh, Renee took mine too. I'm calling myself a gardener right now. <laughs> Perfect time uh, of year for that. Yeah, it is. I'll pick Paul. Oh, 
Paul, you're muted. I'll unmute you. Oh, it won't let me unmute. Hi, you're I'm a mom Ned. to a dog. Okay. I'm from Lansing, Michigan. And uh, one thing I find interesting about myself is I like to keep up with the current events. That's great. And uh, Nancy? Oh, you're still, I can't hear you. You're not muted, but I can't hear you. I heard him. Oh. Do folks hear me? No, yep, yep. Okay, great. My name's Nancy Miller. I live in Harrison, which is central Michigan area. And one thing interesting about myself is I love cats and I rescue cats. Oh. Awesome. I think we have Bethany left. Great, Bethany. Oh, let me unmute you, Bethany. Oh, thanks. Yep, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Bethany. I live in North Lansing. Um, I've been here for um, almost 10 years. I think an interesting thing about me is that um, I just turned 70 years old on my last birthday, and I'm surprised to find myself at this point in my life um, living uh, alone in my own little house um, with my two cats and uh, so far managing um, managing to manage it all on my own. Awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I'm Dessa, I live in Detroit um, and I really love collaging out of random things that I find. And one of the things I like about collaging is that you don't actually have to really buy the materials. You can just use like junk mail and random things that come across your desk um, to make really cool art. Uh, so that's what I do to unwind and, and chill out. Um, I, okay. I thought of something. I like to read. Yeah, awesome. Me too. Thank you. Um, all right, shall we, shall, shall we jump in? Sure. Cool. So um, the reason that we're doing a workshop on storytelling is because storytelling is an ancient human way to share our experiences and to really motivate other people to understand where we're coming from and <clears throat> hopefully motivate them to act. Uh, it's this really powerful tool that is both um, very common in the way that we communicate as humans, um, but also a skill that can be honed or improved upon to increase our ability to be impactful leaders, which is, I, I know, something that all of you are interested in being. So <clears throat> really, um, the skill of storytelling um, can't be overstated in advocacy work. And it takes some practice to get good at it, um, but it's so powerful that it's definitely worth the time and effort to do that. Um, I would say that your story, your experience, and, and the ability of you to tell that experience in a compelling way is really the foundation of your, of your leadership. So as a community leader, being able to tell your story is the super important way to connect with other people and to build trust with people. And trust is super important if you are trying to get people to act um, or support your work. So, you know, building a trusting relationship with other advocates and organizers, with volunteers, with members of the board, with donors to the work, with elected officials and other decision makers uh, is really important. So it's critical that you're able to share your personal story, which we're going to call story of self. 
um, this story of self is really about what in your life has motivated you to do the work that you do. You know, what experiences have you had and what did those experiences do to you um, that made you want to stand up and make a change in the world? So we're going to spend some time today practicing telling our stories of self for the sake of motivating people to act and, and to better understand what our experiences are. Um, so it's a powerful practice to be able to tell a good story. I think we've probably all experienced some people who are awesome at telling stories and we feel moved and, and maybe, you know, that's, that's why humans like to watch movies, right? Or uh, read stories in books is because we feel moved by that. We, we have an emotional response. We feel a connection. Um, <clears throat> but we've probably also experienced people who tell really bad stories, right? Like, you know, sometimes you get stuck on the phone with a family member or something and they're just talking and you're not sure where it's going and you kind of lose interest and you wonder what the point is. And that's fine in normal life, right? We don't have to hold ourselves to a standard of always telling excellent stories. But when it comes to our leadership and our, <clears throat> our advocacy, <clears throat> excuse me, it is really important that we get good at it and we think about it as a skill <clears throat> that can be um, improved upon. So one of the really important things about stories is the feelings that they evoke. So we can be good at thinking about things. We can have all the right answers, all the data and statistics, um, to back up what we're saying decision makers need to do. Um, but the fact of the matter is there's something about the human brain that is actually more moved uh, by storytelling. And so what, what we really encourage is a good combination of storytelling and fact sharing. So that way you're kind of covering your bases and you're grounding your story and your request for action in, in facts, but you're actually using the emotion of storytelling to compel people to act. So um, it helps us stay focused on values, uh, but not as abstract principles, but as our lived experience. So rather than talking about like, I have a value for equality, which doesn't necessarily mean all that much to most people, right, even though you know, we can all say, me too, I love equality. Um, really sh telling a story that shows a commitment to equality or shows an experience where equality wasn't present uh, really is more powerful in terms of conveying the value of equality than just saying, I support equality. <clears throat> um, so Amy, Amy told me some of the things that you all are interested in. Um, I heard that you're interested in advocacy around youth transition, access to health care, access to year-round education, homelessness, peer support, and access to direct support professionals. Does that resonate with you all as, as the things that you're focused on in your advocacy? I would employ for people with disabilities. 100% employment, got it. Thank you for adding that, Barbara. Uh -huh. um, and these are things that I want you all to keep in mind as we're going through this <clears throat> workshop together is, you know, what is it about your personal life that makes you care about employment, right? What is about your personal experience that makes you know that uh, we need more access to direct support, um, <clears throat> Um, to, to direct support professionals, right? Like what is the thing that happened to you or that you witnessed that really made you realize, oh yeah, this is a priority. This is a thing that must be worked on, that must be fixed. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. it's really about connecting that personal experience to the advocacy work directly. Um, <clears throat> so all these issues that you guys are working on are really worthy issues. Um, and I'm pretty sure that you probably, if you think about it, have a specific experience that made you care about this issue. And it's really the story of that experience that we're looking for today. Um, if you can get good at telling that story and practicing it and, and finding, um, really finding the pieces of it that move people the most, um, decision makers in other communities 
members that you tell that story to will be influenced. And after hearing a personal story, they're more likely to listen and understand the importance of the issue that you raise. Right. So again, we could we could, you know, spout out some statistics about, um, <clears throat> you know, what a lack of access to health care means for people with disabilities. Right. We could you, we and I don't know those statistics off the top of my head, but, you know, for the sake of making it up, we could say, you know, whatever. 20% of disabled Americans don't have access to regular health care. And that means that there are 400,000 premature deaths a year and blah, 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 blah. Right. Like I just made all that up because um, I don't actually know. But the point is that's important information to have. But if we're actually trying to get decision makers to increase our access to health care, it would be far more compelling if we told a story about a person who <clears throat> with a disability who got sick, um, didn't have health care, and what the results of that were, um, or the story of a person with a disability who got sick and because of access to health care was able to recover. Um, so we could show the contrast of that would actually be more compelling or moving to a, to a decision maker than just hearing the numbers because the numbers can, they can keep the numbers way up here in their head and kind of um, detach because they don't know they don't know 400,000 people it could be 400,000 people that all live in Wyoming and they've never even been to Wyoming and so right like who cares but when we actually make it personal and share our experience or something that we've witnessed um, and the impact that had on us that person's not gonna forget right they might forget the statistic but they won't forget oh my god this you know, I heard this story of a person who lost their home because of their medical expenses or lost their life because they didn't have a doctor, right? Not to be <clears throat> super dire about everything. We don't have to be super dire about everything to make a point, but <clears throat> just for the sake of example, I I'm trying to illustrate the difference between just sharing information and sharing information in a way that's tied to experience so that people actually remember it and feel moved by it. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Okay, chime in if you have any questions. Um, so can anybody think of storytellers that are in the kind of public consciousness or in the current events now or in the past that were amazing storytellers that really moved people based on sharing their personal experiences? I can't. So here's a here's a, a um, one way to think about it. Who who stands out from different social movements? So civil rights movement, disability rights movement, women's rights movement. Who stands um, out from those movements as leaders? Um, most of the civil rights leaders had a pretty compelling story in the sense of how to shape the narrative of looking at the community of the downtrodden in the sense of telling a simple a simple visual story but it might not have been about them or a, but just a simple scenario look at it differently to frame it in a way to empower people or to get people agitated they go to get into power um, and also to look at um, Another way you can frame it, a great storyteller is the media. Any way visually that you can frame an, an optic of any kind, <laughs> negative or not, you would frame it in a way that it's going to move people. Um, another great form is like musicians um, or any form of artistic medium from visual to, to, to liter you know, literary. Any way you can shape a person to go, hmm, that's a point of view like that I haven't thought about and hit them spiritually and like somewhere deep in their core, then that's, you, you told a good story. Right. Dominic, those are really great points. I want to uplift two things that I heard you say. Um, one is there's a reason that the media, 
does um, human interest stories and interviews people about issues, right? So again, they could up on the TV just have a whole bunch of stats and facts, which they do, but coupled with interviewing, you know, person on the street about XYZ issue or interviewing a person who, um, you know, had coronavirus and is now recovering, right? Or interviewing the family member of a person who's, um, you know, didn't have access to healthcare, right? Like those kind of interviews um, of humans who are telling their story, we know that's important because that's what the news media does to bolster the stats that they're sharing, right? And so that's a really good point that you bring up. Um, the other thing is there's a reason why so many civil rights icons were preachers, right? Preachers, if they're gonna be a good preacher, gotta be good at telling stories, yeah. right? It's all about okay. conveying a story. Um, okay. And so when we think back okay. to the Please. civil rights movement of the you know, 50s, 60s, et cetera, there's a lot of preachers in that space. And one of the reasons that they were able to rise to national fame um, and were able to get you know, meetings with presidents to make these policy changes that were so necessary is because they were able to take their life experience of challenge and discrimination um, and hardship and turn it into a story that moved people you know, who didn't have that experience to understand the experience. And I think that's really our goal as people with disabilities in a world that has a long way to go for us to have what we need. Um, so anybody else, can you think of any other <clears throat> really great storytellers that we have seen in, in political spaces or social justice spaces? Obama. Obama was, is one of the best storytellers, I think, of all time. Um, you want to say a little more about why you suggested him, Paul? I was just <clears throat> thinking about him and I was thinking about how, how he's, his storytelling makes you feel like you're part of the, the story. And it, uh, and his stories excited you to take action. Yeah, definitely. It's kind of one of the ways that we talk about this is creating a we meaning it's it's not just you over here and you over here and me over here it's we right like we are part of something and when we feel part of something we have a responsibility to do things uh, and we have a place in this world with other people and that is a really good feeling right and so inviting people to be part of a we is a really important strategy in our storytelling uh, any other final final ideas of who's an inspiring i um bethany oh, i saw in the I, chat hannah gadsby i don't know who that is who is that hannah gadsby is a, a woman um from uh, born in tasmania and lived a long time in australia she's a an out lesbian comic and she's known for um, her uh, show called Nanette that was came out a couple of years ago where she publicly announced that she was no longer going to do comedy because um, her comedy had been self-deprecating, making self of her um, her identity, and also she's a large woman and making um, deprecating remarks about her own body for laughs. And she said it wasn't um, humility uh, to do that kind of comedy. It was humiliation. And she got a lot of attention for... Um, for her honesty and also even before that she um, uh, she employed personal anecdotes not all of which were happy ones um, in her routines so that uh, people got to know who she was. 
Uh, it was uh, her Nanette shows uh, quite renowned for um, its impact on uh, on people who were doing stand up comedy. Oh, cool! Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> I'll have to check that out. Um, and do you guys, you know, as y'all are thinking about these people who are moving storytellers? Um, how do you see people responding to these stories? When you when you think about when you think about some of these great storytellers and their great stories, <clears throat> what do you how are you seeing people react? We we heard a little bit of that. Are there any more reflections on that? We, uh, this is Frank. We are moved into action. Um, we get a response. They they get a response out of us. Yeah, they get a response out of us. And that can look so many different ways, right? That can look like me tearing up when I'm listening to the radio, right? And then telling my partner over dinner, wow, I heard this incredible story, right? Or, wow, we really have to do something about these detention centers at the border because I heard about a, I heard about a kid there and I am so sad about it, you know, like, um, or, you know, I heard about the detention centers and I'm calling my senator because I want to make sure that my elected representatives don't support this kind of treatment of human beings, right? <clears throat> so you're totally right. It, it, it gets us to act. It makes us feel something. We, get, we have a response. Um, what's important, so it, it's, it is great to elicit a response from people, uh, an emotional response. Maybe they, they remember it. Maybe they tell somebody about it. Um, but one thing that we also need to be clear about as advocates and organizers is what the ask is, right? So it's one thing to feel something. We need folks to actually do a concrete thing that moves the needle on the issue we're working on, right? So it's it's part education. It's also part uh, telling them what to do with that education. And And the more specific we can be about what we're telling them to do, the more successful our campaign for change will be. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so I am going to spend just a couple of minutes telling you a little bit about my story as an example. Um, the I'm going to put, I'll read it and I'm going to put it in the chat, but this is kind of the main reflection question um, that I'm going to address in my story and then I'm in a little while going to ask you all to address as you practice your own storytelling. So the, the main question is, what happened to you or your people, meaning people like you, that makes you want to do advocacy work or be a leader? So what happened to you or people like you that makes you want to be uh, an advocate and leader? And you can define people like you however you feel like it. That could be other people with disabilities. That could be pe that could be people of your gender or your race or your religious background. It could be people from your neighborhood. You know whatever is relevant to the issue you're working on. Um, those are those are the those are your people. You can define that however makes sense to you. So. <clears throat> um, think so. Keep that question in mind. Uh, I'm also going to share a little bit about my story here, and I, I do want to give a <clears throat> ask you all. Um, you know, normally I tell these stories to people without disabilities um, because that's a lot of the the people that I end up training or working with, and so um, some of the stuff that I'm that I would share in my story is, is things that you all are probably very familiar with in terms of discrimination. Um, and things like that, um, that, that some of the audience that I'm normally talking to isn't personally familiar with in the same way. Um, is it okay if I bring up institutionalization as part of my story and medical discrimination? I, I, what I don't wanna do is put anybody in a, um, I don't wanna stress anybody out, I don't wanna make anybody feel upset, but it is part of the story, of my story of self, and so, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not super graphic or anything, but just wanted to check. Okay. Um, so um, I want to take you guys back in time 
30, almost 38 years ago to the day that I was born. <clears throat> uh, my parents lived in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, and my dad was a mechanic on giant <clears throat> diesel engines of ships that came into port in New Orleans. My mom was an aspiring writer and an aerobics teacher. Uh, both of my parents were super excited to be having their first child. <clears throat> and as my mom went into labor, she went to the hospital. She called my dad. She went to the hospital. My dad jumped on his motorcycle, raced over to the hospital to be there for when I was born. And um, when my mom had a C-section, because I was upside down, she was laying there um, with a curtain on her chest so that she couldn't see what was happening, but was chatting away with the doctors. My dad was watching as they cut her open and pulled me out. And as soon as they did that, it was very obvious to everyone who could see, which means everyone but my mom, um, that I was a different looking kind of child, right? I was born without femurs, which are the big bone in your leg, at the top of the leg, uh, without knees, and with incomplete hips and ankles. So my lower body looked different than what everyone was anticipating. And I was immediately swaddled up and whisked away down the hall so that they could do tests to make sure that my organs were functioning and that I would survive. Uh, so my mom was a little confused. <laughs> you know, where are they taking my kid? I want to hold my baby. I want to feed my baby. Um, and my dad, who had, my dad actually fainted. I forgot that part. He fainted when they cut my mom open. So when he like regains his consciousness and he stands up and he sees them lift this baby that he's been anticipating out of his wife's stomach, right? Uh, he sees like, oh, this is not actually what we were anticipating, you know? And is this serious? Like, what does this mean? Um, and the doctors basically just left him to tell my mom, what was going on, but he actually had no idea. <laughs> so um, he said, he told me recently, he went home and looked in the encyclopedias, which if anybody remembers encyclopedias, that just tells you how long ago this was. Uh, he said he pulled out every encyclopedia trying to, trying to figure out what to look up about a child born without femurs or knees. What would this mean for her and what would this mean for our family? Um, in the Weeks after that, uh, it was determined that my organs were working well, that I would survive, that um, my disability uh, would likely impact my ability to walk, um, but that was probably it. And, <laughs> and what the doctors told my parents in general was very appalling. Um, they told my parents that they should cut off my feet and give me prosthetic legs, not because it would help me walk, but because it would make me look normal and that if I looked normal, people would treat me better. Uh, they told my parents that they should put me in an institution oh. and have another kid and move on. Oh. Um, they told my parents that the reason I was disabled was because they were related to each other, which is not true. <laughs> They're not related to each other. Oh my God! <laughs> right? I know. Um, they were so full of it, right? They were so ableist, so discriminatory in the way that they saw me as a newborn baby and the way that they, they saw my life affecting my family, that they gave my parents a whole bunch of bad advice, right? And I really credit my parents for calling them on their BS. Right? My parents, who are not disabled, who do, did not have a disability consciousness before I was born, said, you know, I don't, this doesn't sound right to us. Like, what do you mean ha put her somewhere and start over? Like, that is, I mean, that's appalling, right? Um, and so, um, you know, I didn't know that story until I was a little older, right? That's not something that my parents shared with me as a really young person. Um, but what that what those first weeks of my life did were show my parents just how challenging some of these systems, this, the medical system, 
uh, et cetera, we're going to be to navigate. Um, and they had to prepare to navigate that through the educational system, uh, all the social safety net systems that we would then become involved with. Um, and for me, <clears throat> as a young person, I was navigating those systems too and realizing, wow, it is way too hard to function as a disabled person. It does not need to be this hard. Like I don't need to be facing discrimination like this every day and working so hard to get my basic needs met. Like even as a kid, I understood that. And, and when my parents did tell me about the first few weeks of my life, um, of course I felt so sad and so angry and yet so grateful to my parents for, for pushing back on these so-called experts. Uh, all of that has been the reason that I'm an advocate and an organizer to this day, um, because nobody should be put in that position. And I wanna do everything I can to change the systems uh, that are discriminatory to people like us. So uh, anyway, thank you for listening to my story. Uh, that was seven minutes, just, no, I'm going back to facilitator mode. Um, that was seven minutes of a story. It's a little too long, to be completely honest. Um, I should have sped it up uh, because people's attention spans are not that great in general. So we recommend keeping stories to five minutes or less. So my apologies on that. Um, but I'd love to hear from you all how that, I have a couple of questions as a debrief. The first one is how did that story make you feel? So I'd like to hear some emotion words. What are some feelings you had? It, it made me feel angry that doctors are so stupid. Yeah, me too. Dominic. Um, I found it. I found your dad's reaction. The best reaction I've ever heard. From a person having a disability ever. He went home and was like, I'm going to go look in a dictionary. And that's cool to me because he, I can understand how terrified anybody would be, disabled or not having a child, and, you know, upside down and some other things. <laughs> and, you know, to not have somebody in their life having a disability, um, you know, at that time or anything, I found it really refreshing because most stories that I've heard of of males or females of any sort when they find out their child is disabled is kind of the most atrocious thing that they end up doing like the thing that you would never think they would do and then they look terrible for like the majority of their life until they gain you know some some semblance of okay this is okay and sometimes it doesn't happen so, like, your dad's reaction was awesome, and because uh, I would be looking in the dictionary, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell my dad that. Thank you for saying that. He'll be glad to hear that. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a dream that one day when a child is born with a disability, the only thing that people say to that person is congratulations. Right, and that they can feel as excited about um, their child as as anyone else does, and I and and the reason I say that is because if we get to a point where people just say congratulations instead of I'm so sorry, or you know this must be terrible for you, if we can get to a place where people just say congratulations, that means that we have gotten to a place where children with disabilities have access to everything that they need for a good childhood. That means that their parents don't have to be stressed about how am I gonna get this kid in and out of our house? How am I gonna get this kid through school? How am I gonna find a babysitter? Like all the things that are exponentially harder when you have a disabled kid. Um, if we can solve all that, then when a disabled kid is born, we can just be joyful uh, instead of so concerned. Uh, okay, what else about, what were there, are there any other feelings or or are there any other parts of this story that stick out to you that you feel like actually moved moved you or will help you remember the story? I, I just want to say I'm glad that your parents didn't listen to all of the, to put it politely, bad advice. 
because sometimes I feel like parents are utterly and completely brainwashed by doctors and they get so caught up in all the things that their child is supposedly never going to do that no one ever focuses on all the good that the child and no adult can do. I'm just yeah, thanks for sharing that, Catherine. Um, I think one of the things that you're pointing out that makes a story uh, a story and makes it memorable is um, somebody doing something unexpected, right? And then in a person's reaction to a challenging situation. Those are the, there are, com we're gonna talk about this in a moment. moment. There are components to a story um, that we should be aware of to, to utilize in our own storytelling. And, and what you're lifting up is um, parents doing something unexpected, parents pushing back on an authority, right? Do, you know, medical doctors are considered experts and authorities. Um, mm -hmm. And you noticed, and it, and it stuck out to you that my parents said no to an authority. That's part of a, part of a storytelling mechanism. Um, other final comments before we kind of move on? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as I as I said, I, I wanted you to keep thinking about. So you just heard what happened to me and people like me that makes me want to do advocacy work, right? That's that's the question I was answering. This ex this you know really huge experience at the beginning of my life that really changed me and my family's perspective of the world, right? That's that's what you just heard. Um, and all of us, all of you have experiences like that, that you can turn into a story to get people to do stuff. Um, you're really looking in, you know, back in your memory to, of a, to find a story that tells about a key point or moment in your life when your values were shaped or challenged, right? So a key point in your life where your values were shaped or challenged. Um, Amy, can we share the uh, storytelling worksheet on the screen? Do you want me to do that? Um, yeah, it's up to you. I can um, screen share it or you can screen share it. If you have it pulled up, um, I can spotlight your video and you can screen share it. Sure, I do have it pulled up. Um, and I will walk through this verbally too since I know folks are on the phone. All right, can you all see this? It's called Mining for Stories Worksheet. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through parts of this. Um, and I believe you also all have access to it through a Google Drive. Um, so this worksheet is really intended to get us all thinking about where our stories are in our brain, right? And like trying to locate those stories and flush them out. The story I just told you is one of many stories I could tell about why I do disability uh, rights and justice organizing. Um, so you you also have multiple stories in there. It's just about finding them and then practicing them. So um, this worksheet is meant to be filled out. Uh, so we're gonna take a, a few minutes to kind of individually reflect on these questions. If you wanna write some notes down, that's cool. If you just wanna think about it, uh, that's cool too. But I'll, um, I'll read through the instructions and then give you all a little bit of, of time. So it says, <clears throat> jot down or think about quick notes about experiences or examples that come to mind in response to the questions below. Write down your first thoughts as you hear or read the questions. If nothing comes to mind, don't worry. Try again with the next question. Try not to filter your response. That means don't get overly critical of yourself. Just write down or think about whatever first comes to mind because that gut feeling is probably important because it probably tells you about a moment in your life that was really impactful and you're gonna wanna share impactful moments with others. Uh, so <clears throat> the instructions say move quickly and stick with your first thoughts and don't forget to take lots of deep breaths. Um, one of the things about sharing impactful moments in our life is that um, they might be painful, 
right? Um, I don't know if you all noticed, I got a little choked up in my own story. Um, and you have to be ready for that. And so really taking care of yourself in the process of remembering and practicing a story is also really important. So um, <clears throat> Amy, do you think that I should read through all of these? What do you think is the best method in terms of time? Yeah, it looks like um, we do have a half hour left and um, also possibly people need a little break in there too. I, I think we should check with the group on that too. Um, if there's, if you think you can't get through all of this meaningfully in a half hour and you want to focus on like the first couple or if you want to take the break now and then come back to doing this, that's, that's up to you. Jessica. Okay, um, let me think for a second. Maybe, maybe email now too? I can send it separately as an email, yep. Great. How do people okay. feel? Do you, do you all want to, <clears throat> I can quickly read through some of these key questions. And if you want to jot some things down, you can. And then we can take a short break and you can continue to noodle on it. And then we can come back. Does that sound like a, a plan? Does that work for people? Yes, is that a yes? yes. Okay. I can't see you all ever yes. anymore, so I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> um, okay, so um, again, what happened to you or your people that made you want to do that work, this work? Was it a time when you cared about being heard or seen or acknowledged? A time where you were concerned for others? a time where you were faced with discrimination, abuse of power or poverty, a time where you were concerned about your community, the natural world or the environment. If you had to pick one thing in your life that shaped you into someone who would be sitting in a training like this, what would that one thing be? I love that question. So there's all sorts of people with disabilities in this world. And yet here it is, there's 10 of us here today. What, what got us here? What made us be these 10 people that are learning about storytelling as part of our advocacy work? That could be an event or a person or an experience that inspired you to be a leader. Another prompt is about describing key life moments. So it, it suggests that we think about the most significant or influential life moments from the list of uh, ideas that we were just thinking about. Um, and here are some questions about that. When and where did this experience take place? What are the details of that experience? Your age, location, visuals, smells, feelings. We wanna create a mental picture for listeners. We wanna be descriptive enough that they feel like they're there with us. How did this experience shape or challenge you? Why did it capture your attention or concern? Why was it formative or challenging? What specific actions did this experience inspire? What choices did you make? Why did you make the choices that you did? Where did you get the courage or not to make those choices or take that action? Where did you get the hope or not to move forward? Did someone you know, like a parent, a teacher, a mentor, serve as an example of how to act in that moment? If so, how? What core values or beliefs were shaped or challenged in this moment for you? What was the outcome of this experience? How did it feel and what did you learn? So I just saw a lot of things. Um, I uh, hope that at least one or two of them sticks with you so that you can reflect on it um, and think about your own experiences and what, what out of those experiences, what might be a compelling sto story to practice with. Um, so it's 11.02. Uh, we only have until 11.30 together, and, and I definitely want to hear from you all with some stories, and I, and I have a little bit more um, I want to share with you about what makes a story compelling. So how long of a break do you think we should take? Um, I, I don't think we should take a break. Okay, so there's one vote, and I see Dominic's thumbs up for no break. Um, do, do, are there people who definitely need a break right now? That's totally fine. If, if we do want to take a break, we can take a maybe five minute break. But if we want to keep going, we can keep going. 
Doesn't seem like anyone needs a break. Perfect. Okay. Um, do you great. need a break, Dessa? Do you need to take a drink and a breath? Or uh, no. I came prepared with lots of. Questions. Okay. All right. So, thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, if that's okay. Well, actually, would it be helpful if I keep sharing my screen? Okay, I'll keep sharing it for a few minutes. Um, so, Jessica, is it easier for you to see everyone if I share mine instead? Um, I don't know. I, I think it's about the same, isn't it? I think it's a little different if it's not yours and it might be easier for you, so. Okay. That and Nancy can co-host and let people in and out if she needs to, if I can't see the participants and then I can share. Okay, that sounds good then, thank you. Okay, so while you all think about your experiences and how this may translate into a compelling story, um, I just want to lift up a couple of things to keep in mind when crafting a story. And, and here's the thing, when you're crafting a story for this kind of thing, I'm not asking you to put spin on something or make something up. I'm asking you to think about the best way to tell your real life story, um, the best way to tell that story in a way that moves people. So it's not about making stuff up, but it is about designing the story um, to, to do certain things, right? So one of those things uh, that helps something be compelling is specific details that make the story come to life right? Um, it's one of the reasons I started the story talking about my dad jumping on a motorcycle, right? Um, that's not the most important thing in the story, but it's a visual that gives people a sense of, of what their life was like, something to remember about my dad, the same guy who like went home and looked in the encyclopedia, right? Uh, he drives a motorcycle. Um, clear values. Uh, as I said earlier, we don't necessarily want to state I believe X, Y, Z. Um, what we want to do is use our story to show the values, right? Um, that can be through um, actions that someone took that showed their values or actions that someone did not take that showed their values. Those are the kind of things we can share in our story that shows rather than tells, if that makes sense. Um, and then thirdly, we want to have emotion and authenticity in our stories. Um, it's, it's, you know, in a lot of mainstream American culture, showing emotion is, is not necessarily considered a positive thing, which I think is unfortunate. Um, it's what makes us humans. But in the art of storytelling, being your real self is really important. And your real self has emotions. So uh, we want to try to share that too. Um, okay, so... Here's another question for the group. Do you, does anybody want to practice? Does anybody want to just jump in and take um, five minutes to share a story and we can give some feedback? I see Dominic's hands up. Oh, good. Okay. Let's, let's quit sharing my screen or your screen then, please. And we'll hear from Dominic. Dominic, um, do you mind if I time you and tell you when five minutes is over? Good. Okay. So um, I will say something when you've hit five minutes, but I am really looking forward to hearing from you. And I hope that we're all listening to Dominic's story um, to hear, do we feel moved? Did we hear emotions? Do we feel like it's authentic? Were there details that we remember? Were the values conveyed? Right? So those are the things we're looking for. Um, and thank you for going first, Dominic. I'm very excited. Uh, my name is Dominic Harper, and for most of my life, I've been a reluctant uh, advocate, and I'll be honest about that. It wasn't the fact that I'd ever want to be an advocate, didn't want to be an advocate, but I hated being the first person up, always were the first person up. 
always kind of hated that whole, you should be the first person up. But there's a moment in my life where I want to work with youth uh, so badly. My entire life, I've idolized uh, civil rights leaders and Professor X and Magneto of X-Men. I grew up reading comics because there wasn't a person in a wheelchair or with a disability that I could go, wow, I want to be just like that person. Because uh, media now is different, you know? You get you get to a point where you have speech listen to different platforms now, which is great. But going through puberty and um, finding oneself is a very awkward time for everybody, but when you have a physical disability or an invisible one, you go through a, an inner struggle that your own personal peers or people that you could look up to as role models, um, it's hard to do, right? Because they don't go through the same struggles and you, you know, you're like, well, how can you relate? And I grew up in Southwest Detroit, so it was, it was even more of a, there wasn't role models that I could really look at and be like, how do I go through life like that? My mom had me at 14, and so a lot of people, my family was really supportive, and I had no real connection to my dad outside of comic books. And so, like I said, I grew up reading comic books, and I ended up being a reluctant hero, would you like to say, in the sense of, I would meet other children with disabilities. When I was a teenager, I'd mentor them. And I slowly gained the understanding of, man, this really changes their life, but I wasn't doing nothing big. And then when I left high school, I got into the system that most disabled people go into to get assistance for living on their own or um, schooling. And I was like, we need to teach the youth how to navigate this because this shit ain't easy. Like, it, it, it is a point where unless your parents are well off or well informed, which most parents aren't at that point, they, and, and you have to have the confidence, even if you can't speak for yourself, you have to have the confidence to know somebody to help you speak, you know, convey your story to the people that you need help. I was fortunate enough that I had the ability to do that. So I decided roughly a few years ago, was like, well, I've been doing it already and I need to just get better and get out there to help the youth get to a point where once I'm 60, I'm not fighting the same fight anymore and they can take the mantle and I can fight for whatever I need at 60 instead of fighting for the youth when I'm 60. <laughs> and then looking at me like, all right, old man, sit down, you know? <laughs> That's my story. Great job, thank you so much. Uh, and just to point out, that was about four minutes. So the, the time can feel fast and slow in my experience at the same time. Um, I, I really appreciate that everything you just said, Dominic, I want to ask the group, what stands out to you about that story? Uh, specifically, what emotions, so we'll go, we'll go one question at a time. What emotions did you have listening to that story? i okay, I'll, I'll start. Oh, I felt, oh, uh, oh, oh you'll man. Mm -hmm. The reluctant hero um, made me cheer him on, um, made me focus more on the um, aspect of youth uh, mentoring and how, at what age would I want to stop and teaching and stuff. So the emotional so got, got into me. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, felt, I felt encouraged. Um, and I felt hopeful and I felt, um, I felt like right on man, like good for you, like do it. You know, I, I think that's similar to what you're saying, Frank. And I also think what you said is important, Frank, about, um, 
it really making us reflect on our own actions. That's another component of a good story is causing us to reflect too. What did anybody else, um, what, what stood out to people about the story? Like what's a thing that maybe a week from now you can think that you might remember from this story, a visual or a particular phrase? I, I think the comic book connection really stood out for me. And then um, thinking back to my own growing up and like looking for heroes and looking for um, people that I could connect with that had some of the same feelings that I did, um, had some of the same, um, I, I did not understand myself entirely to be a person with a disability when I was going through puberty, but I definitely understood myself to be different and bi and not seeing a lot of representation there. Um, so like having that connection with also like looking for people that I could follow, that I could, um, that I could, that I could, felt like I could connect to that understood me or that I, they under, I understood them. Yeah, you really tapped into a universe, I think nearly universal experience, Dominic, about talking about puberty. I think most folks feel pretty confused and maybe. Yeah, um, we're, we're all, we're all kind of searching for something, but I, you know, I always looked at it when I, when I was, when I, when I was going through it, you know, I had a mom. My mom would always be like, you're not the only one that feels like that. But when you go to seek uh, counseling or in some type of help that kind of navigates um, other things, you know, mental illness and identity with yourself, you're like, but then your counselor really goes, I don't know how to really tackle that. So you're just like, well, um, you know, I I'm doing the proper self-care and the help. But in now at like 30, there there's times where I'm helping my friends navigate being comfortable with themselves. But the one the one tool I always use when I mentor a kid is I would throw a comic book at them. And I'd say, read this and come back to me. And they're like, why do I have to read this? I'm like, you'll you'll get it in a second. Read this, come back to me. And a lot of males and females, they would be like, oh. I totally feel like this. You know, it might not be exactly, but I feel like this. And so it gained them some help. And <coughs> my friends joke that I'm the reluctant hero. I don't, like, I don't want to be the center of attention, but I ain't not being one. So. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that too. Like not wanting to be the center of attention. Um, and yet feeling like we have something to offer Right, that, and I, one of the other things I really appreciated about your story was that you made it bigger than you, right? That's another important aspect of a story is, is it was about your experience, but it was also about um, not wanting other people to go through the negative parts of that experience um, and really connecting to a, a broader community. I think that was also really compelling. I also, <clears throat> I felt like your story was really authentic. I didn't feel like you were putting it on. I didn't feel like um, you were trying to be somebody you're not. That when you said this shit ain't easy, I can't tell you how many times a day I think that, <laughs> like verbatim, um, as a disabled person. And so that also really resonated to me as like an authentic expression of how hard this is. Um, so it's eleven seventeen. I um, I. I I want to, if there's anything else we want to give Dominic feedback on, we can take a few minutes to do that. But I'm, I also think we can probably get in one or two more stories as practice before 1130 if, if you all are interested. Anybody feeling excited to go? I'll go now that my mic is unmuted. Oh, great. Okay. Um. Catherine, I'm going to keep time. So um, in five minutes, I'm going to let you know five minutes is up if you're still talking, just so we can have time to give you some feedback. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to start now or? Yes, please. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Great. So my name is Catherine Hine. I've known really from a young age that I was going to be the one to 
speak up. I never stood for any sort of injustice or like blatantly just let it happen. I was always the one to speak up about it, especially if it pertained to something personal to me like disability. Um, I went to school with a lot of other kids who had various disabilities until I was in high school. And a lot of them were not as verbal or able to speak up for themselves as I was. So I would constantly, like, I, I would catch wrongdoings. Or I would catch somebody being mistreated or bullied or whatever, and I would speak up. Or I would catch something happening and I would speak up. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm still sort of in that, as people call it with my personality, a mother role. But it's just, it's part of who I am. I can't stand by and like idly watch the bad things happen. And then as I've grown up, you know, middle school was hard. Getting proper accommodations was hard. But I feel like a lot of my wanting to be an advocate, which I've wanted to do this before I knew what an advocate was or what a social worker was, wanted to do it before I knew I could make a career out of it. Um, I, I just, I can't, I can't stop, I can't let the bad happen. I've got to find a way to make it better. So, you know, before I graduated high school, I was like, I need to make this place more accessible for everyone else that comes after me. And I got the superintendent involved and he was like, oh my God, I can't believe how bad this is. And then after that, they were like, oh, well, you've got 19 days left. You'll be just as happy to go that we will be that you're leaving. That came from like that was a pivotal moment for me because if you don't even have support from your school, if everyone in, like there were A's and people that supported me, but the principal was just doing everything he could to make my life hard instead of trying to make me like every other student. When the principal says things like, we don't know how to treat your child, Mrs. Hine. We don't know how to treat your child. I mean, those things stick with you and they mess you up. So I guess that's the short version of my story. Thank you. Great job. Um, and just so everyone knows, that was about three and a half minutes. Um, so let's, Catherine, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, let's, let's give, let's all give Catherine some feedback of what, um, did, did we have any emotions? Were there values that we heard? What stands out as a compelling detail, right? Anybody want to provide some feedback? I heard a lot about my story that people don't listen and don't care. Mm -hmm. And how did that, and Barbara, how did that make you feel? Angry. Yeah. And did it relate to an experience? I don't, I'm not asking you to share the experience, but did it relate to experiences you've had with a similar frustration? Several. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, uh, before we go, I would like your information about your group and how they get in touch with you. 100%. Yeah, I can make sure to share that. Um, and I'd be happy to, you know. Did she you. say she wanted mine or yours? Because I can give her mine, too. Oh, sorry. Did I mishear that? My bad. <laughs> no. Oh, I This is. Okay, yep. Yeah, I would love to keep in touch with you all. Um, and so, so Catherine, I, I want, you know, what Barbara is saying is that it was relatable and that it made mm -hmm. her feel something. That's, that is a, that's a great achievement in a story. 
Uh, Dominic, are you raising your hand for feedback? Um, although I went, I've known Catherine since we were in school together, it's a little hard for me to give her like feedback. It's not hard to give her feedback, but I, it, it does touch on something that, um, that, that courage to stake up for your fellow man is, um, you know, even when, um, you don't, ha normally when people don't have to, that, that compellingness to feel the urgency to speak up for your fellow man is a strong visual and an emotion, you know, for the audience. Because um, I did this, I did the exact same thing in school. So I remember doing, you know, sticking up for those that couldn't speak or some some off-putting thing that, you know, the the community at large didn't understand outside of the disabled community, um, kind of bringing that to the light. So that's definitely, and just the way she delivers it with the, with the emotional like delivery with the sort of fighting back of the pain, that's also like compelling because there's always that moment where you're like. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, what you're bringing up and something else I noticed Catherine is, if, if you imagine speaking to an, an audience that maybe doesn't have the personal experience of this, you probably want to provide some examples of what things were happening that you had to speak out against, right? So um, mm -hmm. if you might want to think about like what specific thing got you really mad as a, as a high schooler that made you want to go to the uh, superintendent. Right there, there was probably something that happened that you could explain in the story briefly, that would uh, help. School, yeah. oh, yeah. That would help a non-disabled listener know more specifically what you were dealing with. I had a really cold chair at the time, and there was nowhere I could go, like in, within the school that my chair would fit under. So I had to bring this tray with me to school that would that I could fit under, but then one day the tray broke and I was like, okay, well, how am I gonna do my schoolwork? So I yep. took matters in yep. my own hand, said, I've got a couple months here, I'm gonna start a petition. And everyone signed it except for the principal. Yeah. And then after that, I said, you know, and I was not trying to be a smart ass. I said, Mr. Hammond, I will bring in one of my wheelchairs and I will let you see what it's like for me at passing time. And he said to me, he said, well, when I was in high school, I had a lot of uh, football injuries. I spent a lot of time in a chair, so I know what it's like. Oof. It's rough. He it was infuriating. So that, I that feel like oh, sorry to interrupt you. I'm just aware that we only have a couple of minutes. I think that miniature story that you just told would be great inserted into your other story because it's it's more specific um and i know like the detail of everyone signing but the principal really shows right what you were up against um the, the comment that he makes about understanding what you're going through um i think for those of us with disabilities is a pretty off-putting uh common experience that we might have um so mm -hmm. <clears throat> great job i definitely felt your authenticity um and I, your values came across in that you thought something was unfair, not just for you, but for others, and that you decided to take a stand against that. That's, that's exactly what a leader does, right? So great job. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually one comment that really stood out to me was, um, you know, we don't know how to teach your child. Um, that really speaks to this bigger systemic problem uh, of the way that education works for disabled children. So I think that was a great connection to the big picture. Um, <clears throat> so I apologize that we didn't get to hear from everyone today. Um, this is definitely something that you can practice with each other or with a friend or a family member or even just by yourself um, with a, a, ti a time keeping device, maybe a mirror, unless that makes you feel awkward. Um, to really start practicing the skill of storytelling. Um, and it, you know, it can also help to write down a story 
Um, I wouldn't say memorize. I wouldn't say like write it down and memorize it because then the authenticity piece suffers. Um, <clears throat> what I often do is just write a list of things I don't want to forget to include. Um, so it's more like a bullet bullet points. Um, and the more you practice a story, the easier it gets to tell it. Um, and so practicing is a really good, a really good thing to do. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of all we have time for in terms of content and reflection. But um, if there's any final questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them quickly. Um, and I also just want to thank you all for being uh, awesome participants and jumping in and providing feedback and all of that. To, um, if we want to, we're going to start meeting DESA twice a month just uh, for sessions with the LDO fellows and the SAM board, offering opportunities to learn and share. And so if the group wants to and you're and we can make it uh, work out, um, we can um, have another session with you where we, we go through some more stories and, and um, work on them related directly to our issue areas and stuff too. Um, there's a a real wealth of knowledge and experience and passion on a variety of issue areas too. So I would love if, if the group wants to, um, to have you come back for another session like that, where we can, yeah, I'm getting the thumbs up, where we can delve more into that. Cause I know um, Catherine's issue area is working on direct support professional, um, the workforce. And, and I know she has stories about what she can and can't do um, and how hard it is to find staff and retain staff, and um, and then I know uh, Renee. And now the coronavirus has made it even harder. Yeah. Right. Renee, and, and I've heard some of Barb's stories too. Like we have these great stories um, that I think we can hone with your help and really use them in advocacy. And I think it's really um, interesting right now too with the coronavirus. There's new ways of sharing those stories. Um, and use of social media, um, ways of building a movement um, that, that we could talk about too, that aren't just sharing with legislators, but like creating our own movements. And, and I know that you've been involved kind of within the traditional power structures and outside the traditional power structures to make things happen too. And it might be good to talk about that too. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a question. Sure thing. Can, can anybody around the state join your group? Can anyone around the state join the my group? Is that yes. the absolutely? Um, it's called Detroit Disability Power because you know most of our work happens here in Detroit, but we're certainly open. We have we have folks all over the country that are part of what we're doing. I would like to join. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yay! Um, <laughs> um, I will get your info from Amy <clears throat> All right. and follow up. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, all right, y'all. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. It's really nice to be with you. I would be happy to come back if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we have a resounding yes on it. Thank you so much, Dessa. Everyone, um, we are back at one o'clock. So thank you, Dessa. We'll see Thanks everyone so. at one. Bye. Amy, I have a cafe.